show, the floor, the whole thing is all mine, right? <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I hope everyone's got a notepad because you're going to get actionable things that you can do. It doesn't cost anything in most of them, some of them. But to do it right, you've got to pay money for this stuff, right? But anyway, you're going to leave this with some new information, hopefully, uh, about improving your cyber security defensive posture for your organization and especially for your members. A bit about me, uh, besides having a couple of books on Amazon and CEO and founder of Kirkham Iron Tech, uh, I'm also on an ISIS kill list. That's probably the most interesting thing, or it seems to be the most interesting thing on this list, but I've been doing this a long time won a few awards, but getting back to the ISIS kill list, the reason I am on an ISIS kill list is because of a data breach. Didn't have anything to do with me being in the cybersecurity industry or anything in my background that made ISIS want to kill me. If you remember back in 2015, right around in there, they ISIS issued about a half a dozen different kill lists, and most of them were politicians, law enforcement, military targets, mostly in New York Metro or Washington DC Metro area, but there was one list that was seemingly random, people all over the country. And that's the list that I found myself on. A few years later, I finally figured out where the list came from. And it had my name, address, place of employment, a lot of personal information on there. And uh, they had got it uh, someone sympathetic to ISIS, in fact, a member of the United Cyber Caliphate, that is, and or it was, and I presume it still is, that is the cyber warfare unit of ISIS. And an American woman that lived in uh, Augusta had somehow gotten a database from Sun Microsystems, if you remember them, and said, here's your next kill list. And that's how I ended up on there. And uh, in fact, it was eight years ago on July 3rd that an FBI agent came into the office to let me know that I was in trouble, but it wasn't with them. And uh, it, so it, it makes cyber security and everything a lot more personal to me, and it drives my passion a lot more. And, and I I'd like to stress that although it doesn't happen often, that doesn't mean that it won't happen in the future. And it's something I talk about in some of my other webinars, but people have died because of data breaches. Okay. And uh, so it's not necessarily financial losses and embarrassment and perhaps fines and other things. Uh, it can be uh, much more serious than that. So uh, just a little bit about Kirkham Iron Tech. We are what's known in the business as a managed security service provider first. Security first always. And that's the way you want to think as well. We've traded security for productivity and efficiency for about four decades now. And that is simply no longer acceptable. You've got to make security job one in your organization. So if you're reusing passwords or you've got very weak passwords, you don't have best in class defensive technology. Maybe you're using something off the shelf like from Best Buy or Office Depot. The world changed about five or six years ago and those protections are no longer effective. In fact, the only way to stop a ransom, a modern ransomware attack is to use what's known as an EDR, endpoint detect and response. And it replaces antivirus and uses artificial intelligence to detect threats. It doesn't have to have a virus signature file. It can detect imminent attacks before the actual attack occurs because it looks at the behavior of the computer. And that's just one example of what you've got to put in place these days. So anyway, we provide all these managed cybersecurity services because the technology in and of itself is not enough. You've got, it's got to be backed up by InfoSec or cybersecurity 
specialists, human beings to respond and investigate, mitigate and remediate threats. Just look into something if it just doesn't seem right. Something's unusual. Got to go in and have it, you got to have all of this stuff backed up. But we also provide managed IT services. So any of you that use an MSP to manage your network, you know what I'm talking about. But basically, an MSP maintains that peak performance of your IT infrastructure, while at the same time increasing your business's productivity and efficiency. It's They're there to be proactive not waiting until something breaks to take care of it. They they want to keep things from going down and minimize help desk calls and a lot of other things that go along with uh, proper IT management. And for larger organizations, we also provide co-managed services. So sometimes, uh, you know, we'll have a large client and they may have a CIO and maybe even an IT director, but they outsource everything else, but especially manage cybersecurity services. It's just, you get a better return on your investment by outsourcing uh, cybersecurity and, and perhaps even IT management as well, if you're larger. If you're smaller, MSP and MSSP is the way to go. And I think this was at the start of COVID, Kenzie, uh, that we really started doing a lot of webinars. And so over the years, uh, what was that, 2020? So I guess we're on year three, roughly three and a half years into this now for when we started doing a lot of these continuing education um, webinars. Uh, we've developed relationships with a lot of different associations, you know, water utility associations, bar associations, accounting societies, engineering societies. And we present hundreds of these every year to y'all's members to bring that cybersecurity awareness up so they start implementing better practices and better protect their, their, their utility or law firm or whatever. But one of the things that we've noticed is the associations have a real need to... Uh, protect their members at the very least. And so that's why we were providing this webinar for you. And, and so we'd be happy to do one for any of your members. Uh, you should be able to get it approved for CLE or we could just do a regular one. And uh, we've got tons and tons of content and articles and books and checklists and blog posts that feel free to use any way you see fit. So I mentioned that the game has changed uh, about six years ago, roughly six or seven, five or six, seven, somewhere back in those days. And what we're seeing from research is the cyber threats are getting increasingly sophisticated. And it's not always about ransom, although that is the, the most common, especially from criminal hackers, because it's a big, huge industry, big, huge money-making but also you got to worry about nation states and hacktivists and terrorist organizations that are just trying to create chaos, maybe by obliterating your data, you know, not even giving you a chance to uh, pay money to get it back. And um, according to the Cisco report, um, that's, that's what's happening. Now, I mentioned that these attacks are more sophisticated at a certain point in time. So what was that point in time? The United States of America's National Security Agency, the NSA, arguably the nation's premier cyber warfare unit. Now, U.S. Cyber Command's good, military has good, but NSA is probably the most well-known of all of them. They were hacked. And their offensive cyber weapons, along with the source code, were stolen. So the very, among others, the very same Stuxnet virus that the United States and Israel and some other uh, um, allies of ours used to attack Iran's nuclear enrichment facility. You may remember that their centrifuges would spin up beyond operational limits and they would basically destroy themselves. But at the same time, 
it was designed in such a way that it was reporting back to the control center that everything was functioning nominally or normally, as they say. And they had no idea. So it went for months and months and months. And they spent a lot of effort making that uh, virus safe and secure because they understood that if it ever got out into the wild, that it could wreak a lot more havoc. So they, the NSA designed it where it would only execute in that environment. And by the way, that environment was air gapped. What's air gap mean? Air gap means it wasn't connected to the internet. And yet they still got that virus into the systems. So that cyber weapon is now being used against us each and every day. It's being modified and used against us each and every day, along with other NSA cyber weapons and other nation state cyber weapons. They're all available for free for the hackers to download off the dark web. So that's what made antivirus pretty much obsolete. It'll still catch some stuff, but if there's no virus, you know, in a modern ransomware attack, there's really no virus to detect, you know, antivirus is 40 plus year old technology or 30 plus year old technology. And it, it it's, it just can't detect an imminent attack, protect, protect, predict and protect an imminent attack. So I mentioned that your most likeliest attack is ransomware. It's a, it's a scourge on the planet. It's a threat to every single one of us. There's no such thing as being too small or being in the middle of nowhere. These attacks are done at scale. Like 100,000 emails goes out. And they think in terms of conversion rates. Like... Say they send out 100,000 uh, emails, and maybe it's members of the New York State Bar, or maybe it's rural water utilities, registered accountants with the state of California, it doesn't matter. So they, they've got an email list, and then they send out these phishing emails that have file attachments, say a Word document or an Excel spreadsheet's attached to it, and they con the user into opening that file attachment. And when they open the file attachment, it has a macro in it, and the macro calls the Windows Disk Encryption Service, and it begins encrypting the files. Nowhere in that storyline is a virus. And that's what makes them very hard to detect by many, many different uh, endpoint protection technologies, especially off-the-shelf antivirus. I mentioned phishing. That's the, that's the number one distribution method of ransomware, although there are others. But you have to worry about phishing emails for other things, you know, uh, maybe to con somebody that works for you into going to Sam's Club or Costco and buying 10 $100 Apple gift cards. And then, you know, it looks like it's coming from you. And, and it says something to the effect of go buy these 10 $100 gift cards and give me the numbers for a marketing campaign. People have fallen for that scam. We have gotten that scam a few times in our organization. Drive-by attacks. These are usually compromised websites. Um, and that's we're seeing a big increase in that. And drive-by attacks usually don't even notify you that it's downloading anything. You just visit the site. And it downloads a ransomware attack or it downloads a server backdoor or a workstation keylogger. Compromised email. We call this a BEC in the business, a business email compromise. Got to have, you know, an acronym, right? We're seeing a big increase in not only compromised emails, but we're seeing an increase in compromised emails of associations bar associations, water utilities, accounting societies. And the reason we know that is because get an email thread that we've sent to your organization back to us. So we know your email's compromised. That's one of their tricks to get the, the next victim to open the email and follow the instructions. Seen a big increase in that. 
And of course, compromised banking, finance, and other types of accounts, you know, your, your E-Trade account, maybe your health account, you know, more and more health stuff's done online. And it, and it just goes on and on and on. I, we just don't have time to talk about all the different kinds of threats. But no matter what the procedure was, the tactic, technique, and procedure, TTPs is what the FBI calls that. No matter what the hacker's tactics are, know this. 95% of successful cyber attacks are triggered by human beings by your staff or you 95%. That's why security awareness training is so, so important. That's why there's no such thing as you're too small. There's no such thing as why would anybody want to attack us? So I can tell you why they'd want to attack you because they can get into big law firms or good size accounting firms or Perhaps they can interrupt a water supply or contaminate the water in a water utility or release uh, released wastewater that's not been properly treated. That's why. That's why we're talking to you, because you guys are a threat vector to your members. You're, you're trusted. You know, when your email comes in, it looks like it's from you. There's a high degree that they're going to fall for the con when it's not you. You're, that's a threat vector. We are a threat vector to all of our clients as our clients are threat vectors to us. But we're also targeted because we're in the business and they know that if they can break our security, they can get into all of our clients as well. So, you know, I haven't heard of a targeted attack on an association, but it's probably happened. And if, if it hasn't happened, it will. There's a lot of attorneys, a lot of accountants. There's 150,000 water utilities in the country. That's, that's some big numbers. To make money, to commit cyber war, a terrorist act, things like that. Got a few statistics. The first one here, uh, uh, only 5% of companies' folders are properly protected. What does that mean? Well, there's a administrative control or a policy in our business that's known as least privileged access, least privileged access to a share on your server. Maybe you, you share all these files out on your server to everybody in the organization. Well, it's very easy from an IT perspective, or maybe you created the share. It's simpler, both right up front and ongoing maintenance to just simply share that folder out to everyone because you trust everyone in the company, right? The problem with that, if you're not practicing least privileged access, that means everybody in the company is a threat vector to that share that's on the network. If you practice least privileged access and only those people that need access to a share folder on the network, then you've shrank down your attack surface. So if you've got client case files on a share and someone in accounting gets one of these phishing emails, well, they, they don't need to be in the client case files. So if they accidentally trigger a ransomware attack, at least those client case files will not be encrypted. Shrinking that attack surface down, shrinking the, the, the different vectors around. That's what all of this security is about. And we know this is a problem. Some of you may be feeling this way right now. You know, this apathy or this, this feeling of helplessness or hopelessness when it comes to stopping hackers. Um, you know, this study says it affects almost half the companies out there. And I think it's actually, you know, depending on the degree and what the, the feeling is, I think it's higher than that. You know, I'm just tired of having to have a unique password. I'm, I'm tired of having to reset my password every 30 days. And you just do it to get it out of the way with no regard to the security that you're compromising 
by not keeping security front of mind. Okay? That's why I do these webinars, is to increase cybersecurity awareness, to hopefully get everyone to stay vigilant and don't fall for these cons and these other types, or, and don't let things happen inside your organization by implementing the proper protection measures. And this one, as of Q3, or Q1 of this year, 2023, uh, according to Coveware, the average ransomware payment uh, is almost, uh, well, over $300,000. Now, that number is misleading, especially if you're a smaller organization. Maybe your association's only got 10 people or five people or, you know, 20 people in it. What people don't realize is the majority of these attacks go unreported, and they're to small to medium-sized businesses. And that's for a number of reasons. Number one is that the sheer number of potential victims is much higher. So their conversion rate can be much lower and still get a $100 million payday. So if you take just the small to medium-sized business attacks, it's not uncommon to see a wide-scale ransomware attack only ask for a $5,000 ransom or a $10,000 or a $50,000 ransom. These numbers get skewed off when you add in the Colonial Pipelines or JBS Meat Supply, Sony Pictures Corporation, City of Atlanta, that when they start demanding the five, 10, 15, 20 million dollar ransoms, but the vast majority are $10,000 ransoms. So if they email out a phishing attack, a ransomware phishing attack to a list of 100,000 and only 1% becomes victims, that's, and they average $10,000 a ransom per victim, that's a $10 million payday for roughly a week's worth of work. It's done at scale. They don't know who you are. They don't care who you are. They're only looking for conversions. <clears throat> Can't stress that enough. I think the actual research says it's about 50%, but I know for a fact that small to medium-sized businesses underreport their security events. So I, I'd, be I'd be surprised if it wasn't 75%. You know, the ones that the hackers don't want to be on CNN. They don't want the FBI to really get involved because like in the case of Colonial Pipeline, the FBI clawed back some of that money. I think they got two to three million of the four and a half paid. They got it back because they'd been monitoring these hackers. They don't, the hacker doesn't have to worry about that if they're only attacking people for $10,000 a pop. The FBI is not going to work that hard. Okay. They're going to aggregate the data and then try to do it from a big picture scenario. But if it's Bill's accounting firm, they're, they're really not going to go to that much trouble. There's too many attacks out there. It's impossible for the federal government of any country, with the possible exception of Russia and China, which is a whole different animal altogether, it's going to be any, impossible for any modern Western democracy that for the federal government of those countries, United States included, to stop all of this. In fact, the White House wrote a letter about two years ago and addressed it to business people, business leaders and managers and owners. Here's what you need to do. It's about two and a half pages. If you can't find it on whitehouse.gov, just let us know and we can send you a copy of it. But it goes into some best practices, these things that you, that's, this is what you do to change the likelihood of you having a, cy a major cyber attack in any given year to change that from a 10 to 15% chance that it'll happen. You implement these best practices and these policies with best in class practices and tools. It's going to drop it from, say, a 10% in any given year to a 0.1 or 0.01%. Those high volume 
ransomware phishing attacks, it'd be very unusual for, for them to work if you properly implement what the White House recommends and other international standards that we're going to talk about. But first, uh, let's say recently, I think this was this year. I think it was earlier this year. The American Bar Association suffered a data breach and they got access to older credentials for almost a million and a half members. So for years and years of membership data was compromised. Now they've got their that lawyer stuff. And, and if you're an attorney and something comes in from the American Bar Association, I bet you money you at least look at the subject line. You probably don't even think about it being a hacker behind the email. Well, they've got your information now. It doesn't take a whole lot of work to personalize that information, to target your firm. In fact, now with artificial intelligence, we're already seeing phishing emails that are that are now spear phishing emails. It's from somebody you work for in your organization to somebody that works for you in your organization, probably about their role in the company. And it's very easy to let your guard down when you receive a spear fish. We get them all the time and we've gotten them for years. But now with chat GPT and some of the other AI stuff out there, they can automate that. So I suspect, or I expect, that that 95% of breaches caused by humans is actually going to go up this year, 96, 97, 98%, because now they can do highly, highly targeted attacks at scale. In, in the past, the hackers had to uh, do research, you know, humans had to do research on companies. So we've been a we've been targeted for years. And they would follow LinkedIn and follow the company on LinkedIn. And as soon as we got a new hire in, started sending the phishing emails to them. They knew who they worked for. They knew what their position was in the company. So they could manually type up an email message and hope for a conversion. It was worth their effort to invest human resources into targeting us. But now Everyone on this webinar is a potential victim by a targeted attack. Other associations, we do dental associations as well. They got hit, the ADA got hit by the Black Basta ransomware. And uh, and I mentioned earlier compromised emails and, and how we know some of the, there may be somebody on here that we've reached out to you to let you let you know it's not to get your business. We needed to let, we have to notify you if you've got a compromise. I mean, we'd love to have it, but when we reach out to people, it's, it's, we got a reason. This, this cybersecurity business, we, you know, it's a, it's pretty busy. So, uh, you know, if we reach out to you in the future and, you know, to let you know, you got a breach, uh, I hope you take it seriously because Frankly, um, that's it's not common for an association to take it seriously. So what's at stake? What if you have a breach? Well, incidentally, if you think the FBI is going to help you, that's an after-the-fact law enforcement, and most of these criminals are in untouchable places. So unless they happen to know their vacation you know, on the coast of Greece, or they've traveled to some, one of these touchable countries, uh, and then they got to be a certain size criminal, they're not going to get arrested. And even if they do get arrested and they're deported back to, say, Russia, or well, Russia just releases them. But you got to worry about your reputation and respect. You got to worry about fines. M American. Uh, Dental Association, they could get fined by the Office of Civil Rights for potentially HIPAA violations. Regardless, you're going to have, if you don't already, which I suspect most of you, maybe all of you do already, have compliance requirements. You know, American Bar Association, 
rules of professional conduct, 1.1, 1.6 goes into detail about what are your ethical obligations to protect client data. Same thing with accountants and on and on and on. You've got an ethical obligation because what if you're a water utility, because water is, I know only one state says this, but it's a, it's a human right. It's a basic human right. Got to deliver water. We can't live without water very long. It, no matter what happens, you're going to have productivity and possibly revenue losses, may not be able to pay bills, may not be able to meet payroll. And then, of course, the aforementioned release of member data. That, that is your, I, I would argue, if it's not the most important thing that you, you have in your organization, it's got to be in the top five. I mean, I, I just can't imagine being a leader of any type of professional organization that doesn't worry about the member data that they have and what specialty they do. You know, bar associations, what it, you know, they get member data that does intellectual property law. That, that brings up a whole different problem for that particular member. Because now we're talking about a possibility of nation states wanting to hack that law firm. They get that whole list of member data from the ABA. They quickly filter out all the law firms for those that do intellectual property, and China will pay good money for that. Some experts say that the amount of intellectual property that China has stolen over the past 20-plus years is the greatest transfer of wealth in human history. All you have to do is visit any modern, large city in China, and it's right in front of you. Those cities are modern. Hardly anybody carries cash or even credit cards. It's, everything is computerized, automated, the whole thing. Now, I know it's a surveillance state, but they didn't go from being a third world country 30 years ago to being more advanced than many Western cities in that period of time without stealing a lot of intellectual property. This probably won't happen to you, but in a normal, say, accounting firm, maybe a law firm and other types of uh, businesses, the stats tell us that 40 to 60% of those businesses will go out of business in no more than two years of a significant attack on their organization because of these things and other problems. So I already mentioned this once, but it bears stressing again. You, you really have to understand that you, you are a threat vector to your members. Your, your organization may not be that big, but it's important to your members. And if you've had membership report to you that your email has been compromised or unusual security bent like that, and you're still operating the same way you did before the attack, just know it, it's not going to go away. You're a mark. Now, you may not get compromised again, but the odds, the statistics, the research tells us you're more likely to be compromised again, especially if you haven't taken any defensive measures. You know, just your emails alone are more likely to be open. You are a threat vector. Just like Kirkham Iron Tech's accounting firm is a threat vector to us and other MSP, MSSP organizations. Those are more likely to be read by everybody in the company. This is true for almost any industry. So, how do you how to get how do you get started what's the first step 
Well, you got to identify your industry compliance or regulations when it comes to cybersecurity. Okay. Now, different industries, they do have specific standards like uh, Sarbanes-Oxley requires investment advisors to encrypt their data, right? They've, they've done it for 30 years, I think, maybe even more. Data's got to be encrypted. Well, now we're seeing other industries where that is a requirement. Maybe that particular requirement hasn't hit your industry yet, but it, it probably will. And furthermore, it is a best practice. So for your industry, you've got to understand what those differing things are. If you're involved in healthcare in any way, American Dental Association, you've got HIPAA that's been around for 25, give or take years, maybe a little more. If you're involved with the U.S. government, you do work for the U.S. government, you've got CMMC. That's a compliance that you've got to follow. Mentioned RPC, Rules of Professional Conduct for Law Firms. If you handle credit cards in any way, you might be subject to PCI compliance requirements. And PCI has been around for, golly, maybe more than 25 years, probably 30 plus years. And, and, and this list is going, it just goes on every day I hear yet another industry that's got cybersecurity defensive stuff specified. You've got to have this in place. The Federal Trade Commission, FTC, now requires automobile dealers to have better cybersecurity defense in place because they handle consumer credit. I can't stress this enough. If you haven't been required, you will be. You're already likely to be required to report any security event to someone at your state government level. You're probably required to notify any of your customers of a breach. So you've, you've already got requirements. Other industries have taken a step further to stop the attacks and breaching a million and a half records of attorneys. We got to get proactive about this. Can't waiting and hoping it won't happen to you is not a strategy. It will. You know, the old cliche. It's not a matter of when it's, or it's not a matter of if it's when, right? You probably know someone personally that's had that's been a victim of some sort of attack probably ransomware we know that anywhere between 10 to 30 percent of the people that attend our webinars say yes to that question now if it happened to somebody like that what makes you think it won't happen to you so i mentioned best practices i mentioned international standards i've done a little fear mongering here and only a little bit, because I didn't tell you how big the hacking industry is. I will now, but it is a multi-trillion dollar yearly industry. There was two masterminds behind a ransomware attack. They're, they went by the alias of G and Crab. Those two along with a bunch of other associates, criminal associates, gross $3.5 billion worldwide in a single attack. That's what the B, $3.5 billion. The two masterminds netted $300 million each. The rest of the money was sent to their criminal associates that provided them with a clean email server provided them with help desk services for victims to call in for to find out how to obtain Bitcoin. Or I paid the ransom and the files are still encrypted. We've got technical issues. So they, they have a help desk company help them, their victims out. And the list goes on and on. It's a huge, huge industry. 
So I am by no means over exaggerating. I could tell you things that I know you would find unbelievable. So that's why I don't go into the real cool stuff. But just know that this isn't this isn't hackers targeting you for the most part. You just happen to be on a list. And you had a weak password. Or you didn't protect your website properly and secure it against being hacked. So uh, that's part of raising your cybersecurity awareness as well as these international standards because these th there's no secret in this industry what to do to properly protect our customers or, or for you to properly protect your society, association. One of those is the NIST Cybersecurity Framework, National Institute of Standards and Technology. It's part of the U.S. Department of Commerce. They came out with a cybersecurity framework a few, quite a few years ago, and maybe 10 now. And it's composed of these five components. Identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. Okay. I consider NIST the gold standard worldwide, and it's used all over the world by organizations and even other nations of all sizes, all shapes, sizes. It can be used by anybody. And this framework will make a dramatic difference in improving your defensive security policy. I'm going to just go at a high level, give you that high level view of what the NIST CSF is about. Number one, first step is identify where is the data stored? Do people share credentials? Do you re does everyone in your company reuse passwords? Is anybody getting cybersecurity awareness training continuously? It's about identifying the risk and vulnerabilities to your organization. A captain has to know the condition of his ship before he sets sail. The second step is now that you know these vulnerabilities, well, let's address them. Let's fix them where we're not vulnerable from people reusing the same password on their Facebook account as they do for our association's bank account. It's bad practice. Got to quit bad practices. Got to do things like enforcing uh, uh, the proper security on shared folders on a network least privilege access, got to implement security awareness training, got to do patches on a regular schedule. You know, you've got to update Microsoft Office, Microsoft Windows, or Mac OS, iOS. Those are, a lot of those are security patches. They're not, not nearly as often as it used to be. You were excited to get new features. Now it's more about the security patches for all these mature products that you're using. So you got to change it. You got to protect everything. Then the third component of the NIST cybersecurity framework as well, that's inside the letter from the White House from the National Security Advisor that was sent out a couple of years ago, I mentioned earlier, said you've got to have automated and manual detection systems and response systems already in place. So what does that mean? The automated tools to detect and respond, sometimes they can only go so far. Sometimes the only thing they might be able to do is detect. Well, and if that's the case, then you've got to have InfoSec professionals, experienced incident response people responding, and you've got to already have them engaged. After the attack occurs, it's too late. We are very hesitant to take on someone new in the middle of an attack because we don't know the network, we don't have our tools installed, and it makes it much more difficult to stop the attack, for one, Number two, it opens up and makes them a threat vector to us, so it decreases our security. 
And it's, it's quite frankly, it's not our specialty. Our specialty is to keep it from happening in the first place. There's a whole different set of specialists in the security industry that are there for crisis management, PR, negotiating ransoms, stopping the attack, and so on and so forth. That's a different specialty in our business. It'd be something akin to the difference between a neurologist and a neurosurgeon. There's many, many different specialists, specialties in this business. But you've still, you've already have, you already have to get them engaged. You already got to be engaged with the managed security services provider <clears throat> to investigate, respond, and remediate. They, get, they identify the storyline. They identify who the threat actor. They identify the threat vector so we can plug that hole. And we know that 95% of the time, it's somebody letting them into the network. So maybe now's a good time to implement continuous cybersecurity awareness training in your, in your uh, organization. And finally, the fifth part about the NIST CSF is you got to plan for recovery. And when in, in recovery, uh, there's three parts of re or three different implementation purposes within a recovery system. Okay. So what do I mean by that? I mean, you've got to have file backups, right? That's primarily for people accidentally delete files and they need to restore it, or it could help you survive a ransomware attack if it's done properly. You've got a plan for business continuity. What does that mean? That means how long can you be down in the event of a significant security event or for any other reason, you know, natural disaster? You know, what, what do you, what kind of policy do you need to implement so you're only down maximum of a day or an hour or a week? Because the shorter that time period, the more expensive the, the business continuity cost. So you got to do a risk analysis on that. And then since you're already in there, you've got a plan for disaster recovery. All right. How are you going to get access to your data in case of a tornado, earthquake, mudslide, hurricane, the list goes on and on and on. Uh, you got a plan for all of that. And those three different parts of recovery systems are usually implemented in different ways with different technology and for different purposes because they have different objectives. You know, you may say, well, we could be down a week. We could limp by for a week. But you ultimately have to have the data back sometime. So that's going to drive the backup system. It may affect the continuity system or the continuity plan, this incident response plan that needs to be a part of all of these. So recover is the fifth part because no matter what we do, we can't 100% promise that you won't be a victim of an attack. Once again, we're just trying to get you from that 10% in any given year chance that you're going to have an attack to that 0.1 or 0.01%. If the NSA can be breached, anyone can be breached. Now, so far I can say that we have, none of our clients have had a significant attack. I hope I can always say that, but I, it's, I, that's the optimist in me. The realist in me says it's only a matter of time. So you've got to do a risk assessment. So when's the last time you did one? You know, do you even know what the password policies are and why they're in place? And if they are even best practices? You know, if you're, if you're IT person, set up your network and it requires you to reset your password every 30 days, to log into the network and you should know that's no longer best practices. We, there's actually a, a better way to do that. That doesn't require a password reset every 30 days. And it actually is more secure. Every once in a while we get a win, usually to increase security defense. It's a little bit more of a hassle and people just don't want to do it. But in this particular case, it actually, you know, people loved it. They didn't have to reset their password every 30 days for no apparent reason. 
So that's, it's about identifying those things. You know, you're writing passwords down on a sticky note. There's a better way. And the better way and best practices is to use a password manager. Incidentally, feel free to put questions. I know Kenzie mentioned it, but I didn't. Uh, throw any questions in chat or the Q&A box. Be happy to, to get them. We're going to have a couple of minutes here at the end, I think. And, and getting back to international standards, this isn't Kirkham Iron Tech. This isn't, this isn't Tom Kirkham saying, well, you've got to do all of this stuff. That's the best way and, and, uh, and because we sell it, right? That's, that's not it. It's the first step of NIST. Some of the things that I've mentioned is recommendations from the White House. These are, like I said earlier, these are not secrets. Everyone in cybersecurity knows this. And now you do too. So once again, it's about learning the condition of your ship. You know, when a captain of a cargo vessel, you know, he's planning that voyage to maximize the chances of success, say, from Shanghai to Long Beach. He's got weather. He's got to know what his crew experience is. He's got to know how the cargo is loaded and what the cargo is. It's got to know the condition of the ship itself, navigation equipment, engines, and just, you know, water supplies, all of that stuff, because it may change the voyage, or maybe the voyage doesn't occur because it's simply too great. You can't eliminate all of the risk. You know, some other ones, do you have people that work from home logging into the company network? If they're using a home computer, you've increased your risk because a lot of home computers are virused up. They're already infected. And then them remoting into your network, your company's network, it becomes the threat vector. If you're only relying on off-the-shelf household antivirus for protection, that's not best practices. So we do that first step. That's what we do all day, every day in our organization. And we go through, we, we are a best practices, NIST compliant, those, and other regulations too. We make sure you hit whatever unique regulation your industry may have, like disk encryption or data encryption. There's a difference between those two, by the way. And we go through it and compare it to what the best practices practices are, what's the best tools we can put on there. And then we, uh, we, we consult on your other policies and procedures that affect or that have to do with IT management and security defense. And so this is a kind of a sample page off of a report. And we we have this unique uh, assessment method called you know the three pillars or whatever and it's about uh, it's about IT management it's about cybersecurity defense and corporate governance and corporate governance basically is required for everybody because another way to think of that is an administrative control right the the three technical or the three uh, the three principles or the the three pillars of uh, uh, cybersecurity is administrative control, technical control, and physical control. You've got to consider those three things. And the technical controls and physical controls don't work if you don't have the right corporate governance or administrative controls in place or defensive technology is being deployed properly or you have engaged already infosec professionals to investigate an event and protect your clients so we incorporate this into all the re the assessments that we do that we do to get that score from a really bad score like this one 17 out of 100 we want that we want to get rid of those red boxes right this is this is before you this is the captain on the ship when before they start lo loading the cargo before a lot of the crew arrives, he's already planning. He already knows that his crew's inexperienced. He probably, 
it's probably going to have to go around that typhoon rather than try to go through it, no matter how small it is. They're inexperienced. So you understand where you're at today. And then step two, you change all those red boxes to green. And you put those things in place. And you protect your organization. And that, in turn, will provide you with peace of mind. And, it, and it's a good idea to do these periodically, at least once a year. Depends, but we'll help you identify that, that as well. Um, if any of you have been a victim of a ransomware attack in the past and your network has not been forensically examined, and I would say password compromise or BEC, business email compromise, a number of things. If you've been successfully attacked in the past and you haven't had a managed security service provider forensically examine your network, I promise you, you have other malicious items on the network. We've never gone into a new client that's had a successful attack in the past and not discovered things like server backdoors, workstation key loggers. Because the ransomware specialist will just go out and sell a list and says, here's all the servers with this particular exploit. He sells that list to other criminal organizations that specialize in doing server backdoors and workstation key loggers. It's just another source of revenue for the ransomware attacker and vice versa. You're a mark. So we do these assessments. Uh, almost all of the assessments we do are free. There's some that do cost money. But these aren't trivial. But there's no obligation to getting one from us. It's the first step because of international standards, best practices. Everyone on the industry does it this way. We might... Some of us may have slightly different tools, slightly different procedures, but regardless of who you use, if they truly are a security service provider, you're going to get these better scored assessments, and you're going to be much, much better protected. So I've got a question in here, and like I said, please feel free. Uh, is, is it bad practice to have Google share sheets with personal data? Wow. Yes. And, and, and any spreadsheet that has your credentials in it or a Word document, do you know there, there's, a, there's a special hacker tool out there? And it's been out for years, years and years and years. Its sole purpose in life is when you run this application, it goes and search the whole network for credential files. It, it knows looks for maybe username and password at the you know the column headings that's all it's that's all its job is is to go search an entire network for a file that stores credentials there's another one that stores credit card info it does that and when it finds those it just uploads them to a cloud server somewhere uh, now getting back to your question is it bad practice to have Google share sheets with personal data depends. Google has pretty decent security, especially if you're paying for it. If you're using free versions of Google, whether it's spreadsheets or database or word processing or email, I've got other problems with Google, even though I, I would have to admit that the data is likely secure they're still mining it because you are the product. If you're using services that are free, you're not the customer of that company. You're the product. They are selling your information. They're selling data collected from your emails, maybe from a spreadsheet, to vendors. Now, they may be stripping out the personally identifiable information, but how, do you, how long do you think 
it would take a really good, powerful AI neural network to triangulate data from just two or three different providers like Amazon and Google and, and uh, Facebook. Seconds, minutes. I, I try my best to not use any free services, including Facebook, Twitter. We do for marketing purposes, but I don't post vacation pictures from Zurich while I'm there. That's just advertising that you're not home. Go ahead, break in. That data can be used in other ways, too, that we haven't even figured out through the use of artificial intelligence. Any other questions? I, I'm, I already hit the time barrier, so uh, if you do have any other questions, you got our email. Kenzie dropped the email in the chat box. You got the phone number and email on the slide there. And uh, just feel free to, to reach out. If anybody wants a signed copy of uh, both of my books, be happy to send it to you free of charge. Just, uh, you know, send your uh, mailing address to that email address, and we'll be happy to get a couple of copies out there to you. And uh, if you want us to do one of these or something similar, we can custom tailor it for your members. If you would like for us to do one for your members, uh, let us know, too, because this is really my job. It says CEO, but I think of it as chief evangelist officer. This is, this is what I do day in and day out. And my number one objective is to raise awareness. I'd love it if you did business with us, but if you don't, please make sure it's the right organization and improve your cybersecurity defense. <clears throat> All right. Uh, well, that's it. Thanks again for joining us. It absolutely has been my pleasure. So feel free to reach out. Oh,